Anaga's focus is very much on the heart of um, uh, housing design. And I think in many respects, um, Anaga's work has, um, has picked up on something that has um, been an intriguing uh, a center point of the of our investigation of housing over the last few years. Uh, um, a few years ago, we visited a project by Buchner and Bundler uh, in Switzerland that involved uh, a kind of shear uh, in the structure, the internal structure of um, of a housing. Uh, a linear housing block with a crank in it. And we also then had Andreas uh, Brundler here to give us the keynote lecture. And we began to think about the the dimensions and the detail of that shear that was in the structure and what kind of opportunities that opened up in, in terms of making a very compact uh, space feel more generous and offer a greater sense of privacy. Now, Anaga has taken that, but pushed that motif of the shear within a dwelling into the realms where it's less about, let's say, strictly affordable housing and more about generosity in, in kind of middle class domains. And the, what I find interesting about this is that it starts to show where our interest in structure and dimension uh, begin to really interplay with domestic environments that might have some wider urban effect. Uh, so, Anaga, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. My uh, thesis is titled The Pursuit of Happiness. Um, so I'm going to take you to an area that's a little mile south of here. Uh, this is Elephant and Castle um, with Walworth Road stretching down south. So if we look at this area, it's very diverse and heterogeneous. I happen to live around here. Um, and we see a lot of terrace housing. We see um, estates. Uh, we see parks. Um, so at different points of time, these have developed, I could say, as a result of a pursuit of happiness because uh, at different points this has meant different things like a house in a park or the provisions of housing under a welfare estate or um, access to recreation and infrastructure. So we can actually theorize urban areas by placing happiness at the heart of the argument about good cities. Now, um, if we look at the regeneration strategies that are coming up around this area, these are often based on an economic argument. But um, what I'm arguing for is that by placing the life of the dwelling at the heart of how we want to live and how we um, form cultures of everyday life that support local areas, we can affect larger urban transformation. So we want to live in our cities where we have more wholeness of everyday life. We have access to uh, recreation and high streets and live more collaboratively. Um, when, and this pursuit is also linked to how we live within our homes um, to our full potential individually as well as collectively. So the dwelling becomes a scene of cultivation of everyday culture and patterns of learning. And this, um, typologically, uh, I want to draw your attention here to uh, a motif that is going to repeat uh, across scales, a, a zigzag that extends the life of the home um, within the dwelling itself and out onto a balcony, which uh, interfaces with the city. So if we look at the uh, urban area, we have patches of housing that is um, disjointed by a high street and a rail viaduct that runs parallel to each other. So um, currently, if you're a person living here or here, there is a sort of disjunction between and, and a less of an integration between the two areas on either side. So, and there are these re really constrained little spaces. So what I'm arguing for is we look at, we bring really high quality housing into some of these little pockets that can start to affect a wider change in the urban area and start to pull the different areas of the neighborhood together. So we see that motif is going to repeat across scales and at the scale of the assemblage, pulling the high street into the uh, depths of the fabric, dispersing services so that the more, um, a rigid uh, hard line of the high street can start to break apart and become, um, become a system that allows for services to uh, extend into the hinterlands and connect the area more effectively. 
while the uh, the armature of the uh, wire ducts can actually start to open up and uh, having integrating services in its depth. So typologically, this area has terrace housing. Um, this has uh, welfare. Um, this is housing from the uh, welfare state, where, where there are poor pockets of neighborliness that are already existing. But if you look at the new regeneration approaches to the area of Islesbury and uh, Elephant and Castle, they, these are based on a, a sort of morphological consistency. And they, they sort of, uh, they present a very strict threshold to the ground, where there is very little integration of civic life of the area. Hence, what we are looking for is um, uh, a sort of transformation of the relationship between the ground uh, and the building, uh, and loosening up of the nature of these blocks uh, to uh, include outdoor elements that contribute to everyday life of the city, and working with the idea that these flats are not just places of refuge, but real spaces of family and collectivity that can contribute to civic life of their surroundings. So we work with um, two different residential morphologies of um, these uh, um, city villa blocks that exist in a part of the park and another block along the constraint between the high street and the rail viaduct that works with linear typologies. Um, so if we look at um, one of the, if you look at these linear typologies, we have a long linear element and a short linear element um, that defines multiple different spaces. Um, and some, sometimes these uh, linear elements can shear and start to create um, uh, more um, spaces uh, while uh, at the interface of the wire duct. Um, so what this also means is that the ground uh, can work with existing elements on the site uh, so that each space has multiple affiliations and that forms uh, an overlaid system of orthogonal and shared um, movement vectors. Um, so the high street can actually extend into the uh, block, sh shearing and extending out into the hinterlands. Um, so these can start to form new ecologies how, and in the way that retail is changing, um, as we see in King's Cross, where the Waitrose forms an ecology with a cookery school and um, new um, markets. So on our site, um, these can also start to create new synergies between the um, supermarkets, between the rail wire ducts, uh, and creating an ecology that contributes more to the civic life of the area. Uh, while the ground takes on more civic functions, rooftops can start to become uh, spaces for the residents. And if we think about parks, uh, we used to think of them as places where one should not build. But there is a current trajectory that takes this thought away uh, and thinks that um, parks are actually the best places to uh, integrate civic infrastructure. Um, so we might start to look at a set of buildings that weave the park um, into the, um, that weave the park through them, uh, where the high street starts to weave in through. And typologically, these city villas have a very deepened plan that allows more civic functions to be um, incorporated within its ground, so that the, the, the cluster becomes uh, not just uh, something that has a hard, uh, rigid edge, like the things that we see uh, currently here, but rather something that extends the services of the high street into a wider area. Now, coming on to how we live in them, if we place happiness at the heart of the argument, we have these two typology, these two uh, residential morphologies that seem quite different from each other, but they have a very similar internal logic. So uh, here we pay attention to the structure uh, of um, columns and shear walls, but within the structure we can incorporate not just family homes but also cluster homes um, that um, can contribute to a, a greater. Um, type of people to be integrated within the same building. So uh, we also look at the motif of the shear that is going to repeat not just in the linear, but also in a city villa form. Um, now, um, this, this trajectory of thought comes um, a lot in Europe, where we move away from these strictly orthogonal spaces to things that shear and curve, so that they, um, they have um, rooms that can be used in multiple different ways. And there is also an extension of the life of the interior out onto an exterior balcony. Um, so if we look at the linear type, we have um, uh, just 
uh, for a basic and selling there are eight units on this uh, plan uh, with private balconies on one side and a gallery on the other. Um, so essentially um, what these uh, what the shear does is that it, it creates this continuous space that uh, is not a hallway but actually has these uh, long continuous spaces associated with it. It also works as a shear as a control mechanism for privacy where um, the gallery um, has a different interface to different parts of the uh, building where the um, bedrooms here, for example, are set away from the gallery while more interactive spaces face onto the gallery like the dining or kitchen rooms. Uh, this also means that within the plan, the, the, there can be these pockets of um, privacy where there is no view from the uh, gallery. So this creates uh, uh, these uh, layered uh, environments that move from the gallery out onto the balcony um, and more, uh, more collective functions are cl uh, closer to the gallery while, uh, while these sequestered spaces um, go, into the, uh, go into the depth. So the, um, this extension acts not just as a, um, a not just to extend the life of the gallery out into uh, life of the dwelling out into a gallery or a, a balcony, but also as a control mechanism that filters the city. Um, also, within this, um, also means that the functions uh, that the spaces can um, have multiple affiliations, uh, not just laterally but also longitudinally. Um, so, within a, a quite orthogonal and, and, and rigid grid, we can have a, a lot of variation. Um, for example, some, some uh, the spaces can combine in this way or in that way, um, and also um, a multiple spaces can face onto the gallery. Sometimes becoming um, bedrooms, or sometimes becoming workspaces. Now, a similar logic permeates the plan of the city villas. Here, we see six flats clustered around. Um, two rather smaller uh, entrance lobbies. Um, and um, if we look, zoom into one of these plants, you can see that the kitchen actually forms the heart of this, um, uh, of this dwelling where it, it hinges, the, the uh, uh, common spaces hinges, hinge around this uh, kitchen. And there is a very extended um, balcony that runs throughout uh, along the uh, out exterior. Um, so placing these in the park, um, for the, the life of the dwelling extends out into the balcony and the park actually becomes a part of the interior of the dwelling. Um, and um, uh, this, this similar logic of um, an extension and a sharing that worked and a layering that worked in the um, linear plan also works in a cluster flat. And um, we can see that um, within the same structure, um, we can incorporate this structure that is kind of a striated grid of um, private spaces, um, a, a wet core, and these collective spaces that face onto a gallery. We can have cluster units. So for example, if we look at one of these cluster flats, um, we can see that more private spaces like bedrooms are uh, grouped and to the back uh, in that line. And um, there are more. Uh, there's a wet core, and more collective spaces actually face onto a gallery. This means that we can have multiple people um, living in the same uh, building, uh, allowing for a more diverse um, demographic to be housed in such an area. Um, a, a similar logic works with the um, city villas, where uh, this can become a a cluster unit uh, where the corners are saved for collective space while um, the uh, ones on the side become um, bedrooms. Now, uh, how does this help transform the urban area? We can see that um, along this um, line, uh, we can start to look at things that are quite small. Uh, they are tiny assemblages of um, two to four hectares. So rather than thinking of large scale regenerations, maybe we can start to think of these smaller pockets of transformation that in a sense help to read this area as something that is more integrated. Um, we can start to form new ecologies with the ground of the um, existing, uh, with the ground of the new blocks and with the existing viaducts in the area. Um, so, um, when we do that, this uh, viaduct starts to become an inhabited domain. Um, so um, that can uh, start to create uh, new synergies. 
so we can actually re retain the affordable social housing that exists in the region, but actually starting to uh, have more common resources that are available for these. So in the end, um, the housing becomes not just a resource for the residents of the area, but um, for a wider urban area becoming, so in the end, contributing not to just an individual, but actually a collective pursuit of happiness in urban areas. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. That was a great presentation. Some really wonderful um, images as well and beautiful illustrations. Um, well, I'll start by saying, I mean, from the sort of zoomed out, the white, looking at the sort of urban proposition, I think there's some really interesting ideas, particularly around the linear the uh, part and the relationship to the viaduct and bringing the high street into um, sort of through and connecting to other communities. And I think you showed some images of um, Hoxton or like short, you know, some of the, the spaces that work off Brick Lane. I think that's what, you know, which actually work very successfully. So it's interesting to, to do, to, to, to look at that. And I think with those, there would be real issues as to sort of are those affordable workspaces or affordable creative workspaces. Um, but coming to like be, being the sort of pragma, be the, a pragmatic critic, I think starting with the linear building, I think it's really also lovely, really interesting plans. I think the gallery is really successful with the voids and the way that you've created these little entrance lobby thresholds. It's really, really beautifully done. Um, it's quite interesting because obviously we know now that, that gallery access or deck access is more and more um, of interest. I mean, sort of 15 years ago, we were doing big presentations to local authorities and, and housing associations try to really, really justify why we were proposing that. Now, it seems like we've got to a point where the, the dual aspect nature of the, um, and the, and the, and the, and the way that those galleries work, as you say, the way that, res that homes sit away, um, bedrooms sit back, or where there's the right sort of activity on the, on the, the gallery. I mean, a lot of the, the gallery access um, blocks from or, um, in the past had very small windows. They were very narrow. Um, I mean, but it's interesting here because the sort of streets in the sky, which we, you know, we obviously were, was part of the sort of 1960s or 50s, 60s development and then was uh, rejected is, is really coming back. But, we're, but coming back with an understanding of number of homes, how these can be successful because of clustering a smaller number of homes together, which is what you've been doing, you've, you've been doing here. Um, so the other, I think the, and then that in a way comes back to thinking about the sort of the pavilions um, and your proposals there, because again, it sort of, it makes me think of some of the, the sort of developments of sort of, well, 60, 70 years <laughs> ago, because what, what that poses, and I think is a really lovely plan around, I think these like entrance, shared entrance halls, you've really been thinking about thresholds um, from um, into these homes, which is, is brilliant. Um, but I think I, it's sort of good now to come and think about ground floor. Mm -hmm. And uh, you've got some great ideas about mm -hmm. that, but the, with the pavilions, in a way, one of the things that's really challenging with, and we can see in, in, in existing housing estates, when you've got a small footprint, mm -hmm. is actually how you make that work when you've got to put bins, plant, bikes. The, the pressure on, on space with those is, is really challenging. Which And actually, from the presentation before, Frank, I, 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 it's useful to sort of refer back to that and the bikes, because actually the bike idea was really positive because actually bikes is probably what we spend a lot of time talking about and how maybe those could be brought up and integrated into the home. So I think what you'll find with the pavilions, which could be is challenging, is how you get those ground floor spaces working successfully and you get the right sort of sense of ownership of space. I think the thing, one of the reasons why we've sort of moved away from the sort of slightly no man's land 60s, 70s housing estates is because there just isn't a clear 
sense of who owns what space and what your relationship to is to that. And I think that would be is really worth considering with your three pavilions and how those spaces between work so that it doesn't feel like you um potentially creating some of the problems that we've had you know in the past um and i'll just uh, my notes on one other I think that was the only other thing to think about with the ground floor uses of the linear block. I wasn't sure whether you were putting homes opposite commercial, the, the viaduct spaces, or whether they were all like non-resi. Uh, um, underground. Yeah. Uh, non -resi. No, it's all non-resi, which is good. Yeah, good. I mean, I, yeah. Pra so pragmatically, the one thing that is 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 seems I can see some bikes and and um, but yeah the. The, the challenge again would be getting the all the sort of all the boring stuff in as well as the activity yeah. um but no thank you i think it's if there's a lot of ideas there that you're exploring and it's um interesting to see thank you anagar for your presentation really um beautifully laid out in terms of your drawings and your your kind of your verbal narrative over it was really great um I am very interested in this idea of thickening the high street. Mm -hmm. And I think you've chosen a really interesting site in that this part of Elephant and Castle has seen so many different iterations of urban renewal, of regeneration to varying degrees of success. Um, and I think that those examples are really worth understanding and looking at um, both in terms of kind of what happened at those times, but also like what's the fallout mm. What kind of place has this become as a result of those decisions that were made? Mm -hmm. And where are, like, what has happened to communities in this area? What are the crucial spaces of um, community and belonging? And what are the services that people use? How has that kind of infrastructure of community been shifted and altered over the last 15, 20 years in this place? Mm -hmm. I think all of that is context for what mm -hmm. you're proposing here. Um, but nonetheless, I think that kind of understanding of what a high street is, is something that I think the GLA has been working on for a long time now. And I've been involved with in various different ways. But I think what's really crucial to understand is that high streets have these kind of really important services and um, they hold community networks together, right? They are kind of hearts of places. Uh, both on a practical level and in terms of that kind of more, maybe the heart that you're talking about, which is more of an emotional sense of belonging mm -hmm. and, and feeling of home. Um, so I think this kind of, but then I think to juxtapose that, what's tricky about our high streets is that they are transport infrastructure as well, right? They are, have low air quality generally. They have a lot of vehicles running through them. We still are at that point where we need the high streets to kind of, sustain the city they are arteries to the city in and out of it um, so there's this juxtaposition of on one hand they're great for um, bringing people together they help kind of stitch together residential areas and stitch together neighborhoods and communities but also they have some pretty negative health implications so I think that's why your idea of stitching together the high street and then the kind of green spaces is really interesting that you're creating these sort of like uh, veins, roots through. I think that's really um, exciting and interesting. However, I think the justification for building over park land has to be really strong. I think you can't kind of say that in one line and expect no one to say anything. Um, yeah, I think that, that's a real challenge. And I think if that's something you're going for and you believe in, then a little bit, a lot more of a justification behind that um, needs to come through. And especially when you're looking at kind of spaces in the high street, why have you overlooked opportunities for infill and kind of more gentle densification as opposed to um, a new build on greenfield, greenfield land? I think you've got to really understand why you're doing that mm -hmm. and convince us that that's a good thing to do. Um, nonetheless, your kind of command of residential um, design, I think, was really, really commendable. I think it's really great. Um, there's lots of care and attention at that scale 
of the home and the interface between public and private and the thresholds that we've spoken about before. Um, but I would have really liked to see a bit more like this, the sort of the scale of relationship between the home and the kind of the clusters of homes and the context and the neighborhood. Um, because I think this drawing, I think is, is one of the ones that's maybe a little bit more challenging. I think this shows where maybe the connection between scales is not quite working yet. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe this is the drawing that you need to be kind of thinking through and working through because I think it it shows up some of the slightly uncomfortable conditions mm -hmm. that you might be creating mm -hmm. through, through your proposal. Mm -hmm. um, there's a sort of looseness and the kind of slightly uncomfortable um, grid and the way that it kind of crashes against the existing and maybe something to really think about like what how are you relating to and connecting with what already exists um, I think that you've identified this opportunity for smaller sites develop development of housing on smaller sites is really important um, we have a the GLA has a small sites program and identifies a small site as anything under a quarter or up to a quarter of a hectare mm -hmm. um, and I think what's really challenging about that scale of development is financial viability. So a lot of developers don't want to take on uh, one or two small sites and develop kind of eight homes on them because the amount of resource that takes to, to develop a site that small for that number of homes and that, that kind of margin of profit is often not palatable. So I think thinking about this as it's probably not the middle class opportunity that you may see it as. Actually, a lot of kind of community led housing organizations, their challenge is finding land. So maybe there's a kind of meeting of worlds of like, okay, you've identified all these small sites, who needs land? And it's not gonna be the sort of developer who would be kind of creating these types of homes necessarily. So maybe thinking about who might want to take on the opportunity of these like little infills and what kinds of communities might be able to thrive in that kind of context and how they might be able to autonomously or more autonomously um, shape the neighborhoods and the housing that they want to live in could be quite an interesting thing. Um, yeah, there's plenty in your project to work on and there is this kind of echo of modernism in your architecture, the kind of pavilion block in the park and the linear block with the galleries. Um, so I think maybe ha having a more explicit dialogue with the history of that architecture could be a really good thing to do. I might take a little detour maybe. I think a lot of things have been said already and I think again, I agree beautiful drawings, really clear. I really like the way in which you sort of reason through your drawings, you know, from the dwellings and the thresholds. Uh, I'll come back to that. Um, I quite like the last urban drawing. I'm not saying, can you just go back? To the, I'm not saying I can't see any issues with it, whatever, but I think, you know, as a diagram, I think it's quite promising in its ambition, you know, to try to get away from our still sort of standard hierarchies, you know, in terms of the urban configuration. My slide detour is going to go, I'm just writing a piece on an East German housing estate, you know, massive, 60,000 inhabitants. Um, and of course, it has all the characters which we still sort of struggle with, you know, point blocks, slabs, 11 stories, 17 stories. It's absolutely massive. And the architects was designed in the late 70s tried really hard, and you might be aware, in East Germany, everything was prefabricated, so they had to work with a, you know, a number of um, defined parameters. They worked incredibly hard to provide services, ground level um, programs, in order to bring in a degree of urbanity into that mm -hmm. scheme. And even today, there's a lot of bias against it. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I think aesthetically challenging, you know, but the diagram really, really works. Yeah, I mean, if one looks beyond, you know, the issues with sort of blocks or whatever, the diagram is incredibly powerful, helped by the fact that there's a housing, primarily a housing association, which is taking an extensive 
care with the ground, with the planting, with the playgrounds, with the schools, with the kitas. They are not pretty, mm -hmm. no. But interestingly enough, um, and I haven't quite gotten my head around why it works so well, but interestingly enough, there's a continuous ground level across this massive estate at the scale of a city, which is not owned by anybody, but everything is open. You can walk everywhere with a high degree of variation. And across the distribution of shop services, you know, they really took care that there are hierarchies. And so there's sort of something like a high street, but each, each sort of cluster has its own little center and then there are different sort of sports elements. Where I'm going with this sort of, in a way, your ambition sort of reminds me of that piece which looks quite different. And I think it's interesting, it'd be interesting to think about, um, so you propose a couple of conditions along the high street and the towers and the park, mm -hmm. however difficult it might be. It would be really interesting also to think about zooming out at the largest district and look at the overall distribution of about how many intervention can you make or don't need to make. I think what I like about this drawing here is sort of it goes away from the linearity of the high street and then we have all these terraces where arguably it's okay, there's a bit of happiness there, but I think effectively to sort of rethink synergies or services or, you know, thinking across scales between the units, I think, you know, that's quite promising. How many of these interventions would you need to do at a larger scale of the district? You know, sometimes, you know, would the three towers in the park with the ground level activity be, be enough um, in the larger scale? So I think the zooming in, for me, the next step would be really interesting to sort of zoom out mm -hmm. at the overall district, how much of that mm -hmm. you think you could sort of intervene in, in sort of to provide something which has both, I think, pockets of sociality, do you call it, as well as sort of uh, services and intensities in order to make it work. I think the other key thing is, is of course also flexibility and adaptation. Mm -hmm. And uh, can you maybe just go back to some of your plans? I mean, or originally the East German slabs were supposed to be very flexible, mm -hmm. didn't happen, ran out of, you know, ran out of money sort of thing. Um, but again, you know, I think what would be interesting in yours here is how can we design that with sort of maybe even more flexibility in mind? Again, this is not a critique. I think I think your plans are really well resolved. I think they work particularly well when you also then show the cluster flats where you sort of show that the that the shear really brings some, you know, a very generosity of space. Mm -hmm. You know, you can sort of see it can be inhabited in so many different ways. I think that's really nice. I think it'd also be interesting to think about the shear as something where the shared space, you know, right now you've got a corridor in front, mm -hmm. which is of course interesting because it activates the street. Mm -hmm. If you think about the IBEB, they don't mm -hmm. have a shear, but of course the way, um, you could also think about the shear, something where the collective spaces are maybe situated also in the middle or it changes across floors. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, this, mm -hmm. is a, it's a, this is a particular typological thing about, you know, how you could also think about this differently. Mm -hmm. Where am I going with this? Um, yeah, I think in terms of long-term flexibility and adaptation, I think it'd be interesting to think about your shears as something that can be adapted over time. So it becomes something else, you know, housing, live, work, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's also that people are interested in that in terms of, you know, living differently or different forms of households, live, work arrangements, and I think to, have it resilient, that's really, really important. But it also then helps in terms of its ongoing urban persistence. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure where I'm going with this. I think I agree it'd be interesting to think a little bit more about the scale between the block and the city a little bit more. But I think in principle, for me, the diagram is really interesting. It'd be interesting to think about the diagram at the scale of the district. You know, are there other solutions necessary or needed? Um, but I think all these questions are implicit in your plan, so I really enjoy that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Lovely project. Um, and I've uh, just a few very small things to say. I, I'd be interested in understanding, going, you know, going, everyone's on the ground mm -hmm. floor condition. Mm -hmm. It'd be interesting to draw it as you're drawing your building, because mm -hmm. I think you're determining a series of thresholds that you've been so careful with. Mm -hmm in terms of the depth of what the balcony access is, the depth of, I mean, I think actually your entrance shear is a little mean, perhaps. <laughs> but uh, I think if you could understand the site in similar ways, because you've left this perimeter that, to me, in my experience of a city, can feel very problematic. You know, a too deep pavement 
becomes a deep pavement can be a fantastic asset. A too deep pavement can make things feel like a little bit like a lost in space. I think Joanna's comments about what becomes back of house mm -hmm. is really critical. Mm -hmm. Um, particularly these pavilions, they do sit mm -hmm. as sort of slightly lost objects within these spaces. Mm -hmm. And they tend to adopt a kind of a loose back mm -hmm. that then becomes very problematic. Mm -hmm. This question of back has fascinated me for a very long time. Many years ago, I had a student that looked at the idea of the internal periphery, which is a really British phenomena. It's the spaces that you get as you travel along a train. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's not quite wasteland, they're quite small. They have a loose greenness mm -hmm. to them that is you don't see in other countries. Mm -hmm. And it's very forgiving. It's not pretty, but it is very forgiving. And I think we tend to erase it from urban environments, particularly within London. And I think there's some aspects of that that would give you a kind of modulation of that ground floor space that could be quite beneficial. Two completely separate other things. I'm curious about who lives in this. It is quite bourgeois. <laughs> <laughs> I suspect quite expensive. Um, and then I think leading to that, what's interesting is that the sheer gives you an amazing play, but it doesn't suggest a materiality where one would really kind of, is this, is this a grid? I mean, is this a concrete grid? Is this a series of actual sheer walls that mm -hmm. actually structure the building? I'm not a structural expert, but it's sort of on the fence mm -hmm. in that it looks like it's being supported by walls and yet those walls get so diffused, it's probably a frame, in which case it would give way to the level of flexibility your other critics were, mm -hmm. were talking about. And it's sort of neither here nor there. So I'm kind of, I, I think it could be more definitively one thing or the other where those are not necessarily kind of thin bits of frame, but they mm. could be actual walls or they are just simply, you know, a grid frame that mm. then is manipulated and shifted mm. in a variety of different mm. ways. Mm -hmm. um, presumably there's trains going past. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> but some beautiful images and obviously a lot of work is going to, so thank you. thank you. For me, there is an interesting question about your choice of slabs and towers. The point has been made, you know, mm -hmm. they are possibly, not only, but modernist, mm -hmm. uh, part of modernist legacy. Um, when I, I admire modern planning in so many ways, but I think the case still to be made by you, why is this choice of forms, while at the beginning you show the whole extent of the area in South London with many more typologies you could have referred to. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing is so sheer, which has just been mentioned. Um, I, I think it's interesting as a means to create notably privacy, um, but also it's interesting as a means to create diversity within the dwelling. Um, and I wonder whether it could have been explored further. And to me, to actually think of the shear walls as structure, which seems to be indicated mm -hmm. on the plan, mm -hmm. might actually be an unnecessary constraint, uh, while uh, point grids might have been a more effective uh, solution. Um, so a question there. I think it's a very interesting line of inquiry but one which uh, I think is open to development. And the last thing I would say is, you know, you referred at the very beginning about the, the civic uh, aspect of the scheme. Um, I, I think this really needs to be explored in more details about what you mean by the civic realm. It can mean so many things. I don't see, for instance, why we wouldn't accept the ideas that modernist planning offers the civic realm at ground level. It so happens to be much less intense uh, in terms of use and elsewhere. Um, I also think that uh, it might suggest a different treatment with the point blocks and the slab partly because of where they are, mm -hmm. and also partly because of the forms. So I think more, more details there uh, would be welcome. But I, I, I must say I enjoy it. And to me, it partly indicate a shift in housing and urbanism towards a much more thoughtful approach to housing, which obviously is something I embrace. Yeah. <laughs>
Yeah, it's crying out for some model. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, just, I would love to, because also the folded yeah. the way in which you fold the mm. material as mm. opposed to, I mean, how that, I know you can, you can render the hell out of anything, obviously, yes. but the physical place yeah. of the model would be amazing. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, we've been wanting to shift models for ages, but we've got no space to put them. Uh, but, um, <laughs> yeah, we, we, I agree. We, I agree. I, I agree that uh, we're we're waiting to get that resolved. I think we're about there. Um, but the uh, I think these um, these points that have been raised are super helpful and actually mirror many of the discussions that uh, that have been ongoing. I think quite clearly you put uh, a stronger emphasis upon the flats themselves than the ground, uh, and a lot of what we were I think discussing over the course of tutorials had. We, we left the ground uh, a little bit behind because we were really, I think as Irene has pointed out, we really wanted to get to a point where the, the flats were more convincing. Now, I think the, the, um, the point that uh, has been raised from a few different directions, who would live here, who would invest in this, is something that we would indeed want to explore more widely. We know that um, a lot of, as uh, Shamiso has pointed out, independent developers will avoid sites like these because of the, the, um, the, the risk associated with going anything over nine flats um, and the, the, the problems, particularly in these kinds of areas. But I think this is exactly why we would want to explore structures that offer the opportunity of working both as, uh, as sale flats and possibly as something that might invite collaborative approaches to the development of buildings where you can begin to think in terms of some of it being cooperative, dri uh, driven by cooperative and other parts of it being sold. So uh, I think this is something that we're uh, kind of along the lines that Ingrid has pointed out. Ideally, we would investigate more fully together with the development community how these things might become possible. I mean, with all developments, the reality is, I mean, with developers will be required to provide 35% affordable housing as a minimum, but sometimes that can be negotiated. But it, it so I think in a way it, it's sort of this sort of idea that it's a sort of more of a middle class housing is, is something that wouldn't really like be likely to happen. Um, I mean, where other balances could be, which would be whether there's some sort of cross subsidy of the affordable ground floor uses. But again, you know, exactly what those are. And, um, and I was just going back to your plan, actually, which is a wonderful plan, which of, of the sort of linear proposal within the context. I mean, ideally, you want to actually show what's happening at the ground floor of all of those buildings that are surrounding. And, and now more and more with the developments we work on, I and mean, developers definitely have now are appointing consultants to do more research into an area into the area to look at what community need there is what are the sort of growing industries um, so if there's any work that you can do that just enables you to sort of identify the type of space the type of um, businesses or um, workspaces or community uses that you might be proposing at ground floor it would be worth looking in into that Any other comments or questions from others in the audience? Steve. Just to add to Joe's point, we've talked about it before, but if we look at the nearby recent development in between the roads mm -hmm. and the railway line, yeah, yeah. we'll see gated communities. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, <clears throat> their ground floor is very conditioned and very much private zone. So I think it's where you position yourself on that ground level, following on Joe's. Mm -hmm. Anaga, thank you very much. It was a delight. Thank you. Thank you.